Good evening, everyone. I'll wait a couple, about a minute here, let everybody get into the room, and then uh, we'll get started with the webinar tonight. Uh, for the webinar, do you have a presentation uh, to kind of go through our topic, uh, maximizing your exposure on the PKB this summer and how to develop your player's profile to, to gain further opportunities coming up in the fall and the new season? Uh, so we'll walk through some different slides talking about those and other topics, and then I'll have a question and answer period at the end. I'll use the chat function here on the webinar. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask a question there in the chat and then um, I'll either answer along the way or we'll catch them there at the end in the question and answer period. So appreciate everybody joining us and uh, we'll get started with our webinar. Again, uh, welcome to our Maximizing Your Schedule webinar. I'm Mike Parker. I'm the tour director for Peggy Kirk Bell Girls Golf Tour and the executive director of the Girls Golf of America Foundation um, that runs and operates the Peggy Kirk Bell Tour. I've been with the tour since its inception, uh, working with Robert Linville and uh, Chris Harlow to put together um, this tour from the foundation that it that it spawns. I've uh, been now in golf uh, for 22 years and specifically in junior girls golf for 17. Uh, so have uh, enjoyed the process of learning uh, more about the junior girls game and, and watching the, the Peggy Kirk Bell grow uh, through this uh, decade and a half now. Um, brief background about the tour. Again, we started in 07 as a, a regional series in North Carolina and just continued to grow over the years. Uh, about 1,200 uh, members now, uh, over 140 tournaments per year that are being run uh, through the, the tour. Our main focus, these, uh, our mission is still hasn't changed from day one. Uh, the main focus is to uh, actively increase participation in interest girls golf by making a girls focused product. Um, we wanted to make sure there was an venue for aspiring collegiate players to have a place to, to develop their games and compete and ultimately be recognized for their accomplishment. Um, and at the same time, being cost conscious as we could uh, to keep these tournament opportunities affordable as well as uh, getting the best value that you can for your, your dollar in the tournament space. So tonight's webinar, we're gonna focus again about scheduling. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, what the US tournament landscape looks like for girls. I'm gonna talk about uh, the Peggy Kirk Bell pathway, why we, we do the things that do the way we do. Um, I'm gonna talk about the summer tournament schedule, how now is the time that you're able to leverage your player's resume and developing that to create opportunities for the fall and winter as we start to springboard next year. You know, they're just finishing a school year, they're heading towards their next season, our, our rising juniors are now in the active recruiting phase where they can communicate with coaches. Uh, there's a lot of change during this window, lots of opportunity. Uh, so how do you get the most out of that to, to kind of prepare yourself to springboard next year? So when you're you know, getting to spring and summer of next year that you're in the position that you want to be in as far as the tournaments you're able to play in and the exposure you're getting for your player. Um, I've done about five tips about how to develop a schedule, things that we've learned over the years of doing this that hopefully can be helpful in, in helping you develop a schedule for your player. Uh, and, then, and then there at the end, we'll talk about um, any questions that you have. All right, so let's start with the U.S. tournament landscape for girls. Um, so you've got multiple different groups that are putting on tournaments. You have your associations and your PGA sections that are either sponsored by the PGA or the USGA. Um, most of these are geographic based. Uh, the sections through the USGA are all state based or majority state based. Uh, your PGA sections are more regionally based. 
You've got nonprofit foundations like Artur, the Peggy Kirk Bell, the AJGA, First T, other organizations that are out there with a nonprofit mission to get more access to the game. And then you have the for-profit tours. So you have organizations who are running events to make money um, and are putting on lots of tournaments that go. Um, and then within the nonprofit and the for-profit space, you have these individuals, uh, individual events that, that pop up or have been here for years that, um, that exist within both of those spaces. Um, which does, you know, the, one of the number one challenge that, that parents ultimately face is there is no sanctioning body for junior golf. It's not like junior tennis or other uh, sports where you have a national organization that sanctions the tournament's pathway and you progress through a predetermined path that you would go to to move to the next level and each step in the level, um, which puts a, a very... Um, it's very challenging for, for families to one, understand what is best for their child and how to proceed through this uh, junior career, as well as it's ever changing because there is lack of that structure presents this possibility that new things can just pop up overnight and become relevant very quickly. Um, so how would you know, just any old person know that that's a thing when it just shows up and becomes a thing. And that, that's very, that's very common, actually, that you'll see new events that will pop up um, and, and really resonate. I know the junior golf landscape today versus 15 plus years ago when we started this tour is dramatically different as far as the, the different tours that are operating and the, the value for each. Um, you know, and the thing to remember is a lot of these organizations are all motivated by different factors. Some are strictly about trying to develop players, and that's what their goal is, is just give kids access. You have some for-profit tours that it's purely a financial gain. They're looking to make money off of this tournament that they're putting on. Uh, yes, you'll be shocked that ego exists in the industry as far as, you know, my tournament is amazing, the, the word elite and uh, the different terms that you get used get thrown around a lot to try to create stature for an event. Um, and, you know, opportunity, I think, is, is why our tour was built, which was we wanted to have more opportunities for the girls to get out and to, to compete and be recognized. So you know, a lot of the organizations have different whys, and I'll talk about a little bit more about ours. Um, but that is something that you'll, you'll find is may determine the experience that you have with the different events based on the why of why these events exist. Um, so one of the results of the lack of this kind of structure is there's numerous pathways that you, your child can ultimately go through to get elite level competition and the recognition that you're looking for to, to create exposure to the collegiate coaches, um, and to prepare for, for the collegiate game and potentially beyond. There isn't just one path. Um, so you have different ways to be able to go about it. Um, for example, I listed a couple of the top level events that you may get want to get to and how you'd get there. So, uh, for example, the USGA Girls Championship, same with the U.S. Open or the U.S. Women's AM, you have to regionally qualify to be able to get in to those events. Um, and to be able to play in a regional qualifier, you have to have a certain handicap. So you're establishing a handicap at a local club to be able to get into their progression. Same with the PGA Girls Championship, a great event uh, each summer. They have sectional qualifiers put on by each PGA section. Um, to get into those, you may have qualifying within that PGA section to be able to get into that uh, sectional qualifier. Um, your state girls, uh, amateur, your state women's amateur, um, they may require you to have a certain state ranking or have qualifying that gets you into those tournaments, depending on how large your state is. Um, your AJG invitationals, your, you know, these are the largest or, or sorry, the most prestigious um, junior golf tournaments in the country. They're, they're a small subsect of their invitationals. So you have to earn the status that gets you into those, whether it's through the AJGA opens or through your performance-based entry. Um, you know, here on the PKB, our invitationals, spring invite, um, 
the main our, our fall invitational regional tournament or national tournament champions these are events that you have to earn status to be able to get into so whether it's through the pkb national series or your performance index and your junior golf scoreboard ranking is what's allowing you to get access to get into those bigger events um same with uh, the Peggy Kirk Bell Notabagay the Third National Championship, the one that's hosted in November that'll be on the Golf Channel. You know, you have to qualify at a regional final across the country to be able to get access to those. So there's this preparation that has to go into building your schedule to understand, you know, or to get the opportunity to get into these bigger events. So one of the first things you're going to want to look at is prioritize each season of event or two that that is the ultimate goal. Like I'm working towards this tournament. I want to play in that and building a schedule that helps achieve that goal. And realistically, that's a 12 month process to be able to look out to what the long term goal is as far as setting yourself up to potentially being able to qualify for it because you have to develop the status that ultimately may get you in. Um, so at the national level, um, you know, like I mentioned, just kind of summary here, you have not only your tours running these big invitationals like ours or the AJGA, um, then you also have these independent events. Um, the USGA Championships, the Scott Robertson's a great one, just happened a couple weeks ago. Um, the North and South in early July down in Pinehurst. These are events that have long histories, um, very prestigious events, well regarded by the coaches uh, collegiately. So you're able to get that exposure and, and a real quality experience if you're able to qualify and participate. Most of these events, you have to have a, enough status, typically by ranking or maybe performance in some other tournaments that ultimately get you into those events. Um, and then, you know, within your tours and state championships are also, you know, prestigious events that are going to get you the exposure. Um, you know, when you're developing a plain resume to put in front of college coaches, you know, they're looking for those events that they know, those events that have been around for years that that have stature. If you can perform well in those environments, you know, that's going to, you know, be a feather in the cap of your resume. Uh, so those are always beneficial to, to have as part of your your plain resume. Um, so uh, just a kind of a case study example of one of the associations. So here in the Carolinas where we're located, our home, uh, the CGA is one of the, the leaders in the nation for, for girls golf opportunities. Uh, so they have multiple girls only championships that they run, including the North Carolina girls, South Carolina girls, and um, in C or Carolina's girls in the summertime, but also the Vicky DeSantis championship, the Jimmy Anderson Invitational that are in the off seasons as well. Uh, so there's numer numerous good opportunities there. Um, you also can get status to some team events, which are really unique offerings, like the Mid-Atlantic Girls matches um, that, that, it, that you get um, by, by developing status there. Um, and then, you know, the, as a section or as an association, they're also running developmental programs. Uh, so they have what they call Taiga here in the Carolinas and in South Carolina, they have their chapter series. Uh, these are developmental events that are low cost access, well-structured events that are great for players who are in the developmental process that are just looking for rounds and trying to get um, experience in the process. That's really where the associations can be real beneficial is for our, our developing and newer players to get just tournament rounds in a nice structured environment at a very cost conscious way. That's what the, these sections can provide. Um, so that leads us into kind of the Peggy Kirk Bell system. Why do, why do we have our pathway progression? What is our pathway progression? Um, and, and I'll go into just a little bit about how we're structured and, and the why. Um, so, so the main point for us was we wanted to not be constrained by the age of the player, but by the, the skill and the yardage that the player may play so that it's more of a developmental focused progression versus versus an age progression. Um, the main reason why we started this way and have kept it all these years is you get a lot of uh, girls that come to golf, um, maybe in middle or early high school even, come from team sports, still are competitive, athletic, 
but maybe team sports socially may not have been the best fit. Golf became a real, uh, you know, possible um, opportunity for them to, to still pursue athletics and potentially collegiate uh, athletics. Um, so giving that player the same opportunity as the player that may have come from U.S. kids in a competitive environment since they were eight, nine, 10, um, and making sure that each of those players had an environment competitively that both met where their skills were as a golfer, but also the social dynamic and, and other places that are played when we're dealing with preteen and teenage girls. Um, so our progression created different steps along the way that tried to take into account those factors um, to get each player in a chance not only to be successful as they were you know developing their games but also be comfortable as they're maybe playing in their first couple tournaments and getting exposed to tournament golf uh, so our pathway is really trying to kind of thread that needle of, of looking at both sides of the equation as you're one motivating players to continue to pursue competitive golf but also providing them the necessary challenges that they require to develop that game to be able to ultimately meet their goal of collegiate golf or, or beyond. Um, so for the Peggy Kirk Bell Tour, you know, we have our Discovery Futures Prep Bell progression, which we call our classifications, four, three, two, one. Um, so each player has a specific classification that ultimately gives them access to different tournaments on this pathway. The unique thing or, or a little bit different thing about the Peggy Kirk Bell Tour is we run a season that pretty much goes fall to summer. Um, so it more matches your school year versus a calendar year as far as how we are structured. So right now here in the summer, we are national programs. So these are multi-day uh, two and three day tournaments for our more competitive players, which is the PKB National Series is building towards the tour championship in August at Pine Needles. Um, so we're, we're almost done with our national season for 22-23. Um, you have um, additionally the, the regional program, which is our more developmental program, is in full swing. So we're just getting started in some areas and in the middle of the, the series as we're building towards those finales in the fall. Um, at the same time, we now have, with our new partnership with the uh, Girls National Championship, this is the net qualifiers across the country to be able to qualify for the, the National Championship in November on the Golf Channel. Uh, so that's a, something that you can, can add to your schedule to try to qualify for a, a really unique experience uh, there at, uh, at Cachada. Um the fall is when we transition. The girls go back to school. They have school golf. So we definitely believe in, in playing school golf. Many of our, our, our regions uh, play school golf in the spring. There are a few that play, or excuse me, we have a few that play in the spring, but the majority of our service area um, plays high school golf in the fall. Um, so our regional series are typically ending in September, some in early August. Um, we will start to begin our national program there in the middle and late of fall as we start to gear up for the new season. Um, and then some of the biggest events on our schedule are actually there in the late fall uh, with our big invitational and tournament of champions and different events. Um, so a lot of, again, talking about this is how you get into those events. Uh, the winter, you're going to have once a week, you're going to have a national level event that you know, throughout, whether it be the Carolinas or South or, or some in the mid-Atlantic in the early part of the winter, these are um, some of the strongest fields the Peggy Kirk Bell Tour offers. Um, a lot of, most of the associations have all stopped in this period. Uh, AJGA is very thin during this period. Um, so these tournaments typically are some of the highest ranked tournaments in the country each weekend. Um, for for girls and throughout that winter period there's, there's some really good opportunities um, we also have our linville cup event uh, our team event which is for our top regional finishers um, which is a real unique event there in january and then as we head into our spring you know this is the weather starting to turn our national program starts to expand into northern and southern events uh, we have some of our big invitationals 
in and around spring break. Um, our 54 hole events, a couple of different championships there with our masters event and our open championship, like we just played this past weekend. Um, and then that's typically when your regional series are starting to start. So you have this, this kind of build. Um, so if you're a national level PKB player, you know, the winter and the spring is really the heart of the schedule. And for our regional players, it's more spring, summer um, as, you, as you're moving through. Um, this is just a quick recap of 2022-2023. So there were 12 championship events, 30 national events, 70 plus regional events. Um, and then we had 22 different regional finals across the country to qualify for the national championship event. So how do you leverage these tournaments to kind of create some more opportunities for your daughter? Um, so on the PKB side, there's kind of these focal points. So tour championship uh, held at Pine Needles in August. So you're playing the U.S. Open golf course from last year uh, for a 54 hole event in August. So qualification for that series, that's the Bell National and the Futures National season finale. Uh, so that to get into that tournament, it is based off the order of merit standing for that year. So order of merit is how you played in the division. So how do you played in the all the Bell National events you played in or similar, your Futures National players, how you played throughout the whole Futures National series. Um, it looks, order of merit looks at your top five events within that series. Uh, so typically, you know, you're looking to play at least five events to maximize your points uh, within those series. You can play more and improve. Um, but, you know, if you don't get to five, you're not maximizing the, the points that you could ultimately be earning. Uh, so if you're looking to play tour championship in one of these divisions then you need to schedule throughout the year five or more tournaments, the way multipliers work and the way that the things you're higher your championship level events are going to have more value than your you know your next event down like your championship or your priority based entry event and then below that your sign up and play event so there's kind of tiers within the national schedule and uh, that that you want to prioritize those events are going to be worth you know have more points attached to them which is how you're already getting order of merit status the order of merit is also based off of size of fields. So the larger fields that you get into, the more points you're able to accrue. Um, so you've got the size of the field and the multiplier really determining how many points are ultimately available at a tournament. Um, as with everything, whether we're talking about rankings or anything, playing well, shooting lower scores is ultimately going to earn you these opportunities. You can, on the margins, be able to maybe figure out a perfect schedule, but at the end of the day, if the player plays well, it usually takes care of itself. Um, but hopefully I'll add some other pieces to kind of think about as you're putting together your schedule. Um, as you think about the big tournaments, so the invitationals, the things that you can't just sign up and play, um, you know, on the Peggy Kirk Bell, there's three real major tournaments that we run uh, in the winter, fall, winter, spring, as you're kind of going. And that's our, our, our main invitational, our national tournament of champions, and then the spring invitational at Birdwood at UVA. Uh, so these are all top 50 events. So of all the junior golf tournaments in the country, all three of these are in the top 50 by ranking um, as far as the quality of field that you're going to get. So, you know, if you're a player looking to play top events and get exposure for your player, and you're living in this region in particular, if you're on the East Coast, these are great opportunities that you don't otherwise have access to. Um, to get into these events, you know, you're looking at either wins or excellence at national level events, whether they're within the PKB program or if they're in other places, but you're looking to improve uh, what your PKB performance index, that is how you have played on the Peggy Kirk Bell Tour or Junior Golf Scoreboard, which is the national ranking system, which looks at every multi-day tournament across the country to weight players. Uh, so those two factors are what we use on our tour to set priority-based entry. Um, that's what ultimately can get you in to spots on these invitationals. Uh, for example, the, the fall invitational and the spring invitational, about half the field will come in off of 
their ranking. The other half are going to come in off of predetermined exemption status. So for example, in the fall invitational, the top 25, 30 players on the bell order of merit for the previous year are automatically exempt at that event. So if you proved over the course of the previous season, you were an elite player on the tour, then you're getting access to the PKB invitational. Um, the tournament of champions event, that is, as it sounds, you have to be a champion. So to earn a spot in that field, which is a very, you know, uh, special field because only players that have won tournaments, uh, whether you've won a national level tournament, that doesn't matter the division, whether it be Bell National, Prep Preview, or Futures National. So you won a national level tournament or a very high finish at a championship level event, typically top three. Those are the players that are getting invited to national tournament of champions. So it's not just an event that you can apply to play in. You have to earn your way in. So again, you're looking at the schedule and you're seeing, you know, we've got five summer events. Typically the summer events may not be as large. This is a great opportunity to go and win an event and get into a, um, the national tournament of champions. Um, so, you know, looking for those opportunities. For our regional level players, it's about leveraging these developmental tournaments and getting this exposure and development for your player and then using that to be a springboard for their next season, because we're hoping that each year we're progressing in, in some manner, whether it's within a division, we're moving from establishing ourselves in a division to competing to potentially win events at our division, or maybe it's to progress from our classification to move from classification three to classification two, so we can start playing longer yardage divisions in the next division up um, yardage wise. So for our regional level players, you know, winning at the regional level, going to any of our regional tournaments and winning is going to get you invited to regional tournament champions. That's a national level multi-day tournament that earns status and ranking points on our national program. So for these regional players, this is a great way to start that promotion to the next level of competition. Um, the Prep and Futures Invitational in December, another chance for top order of merit finishers in the regional program to get access to another national level tournament um, that has a select field. You know, these select fields have stronger strength of fields because they're only players who have shown the ability to perform at a higher level. Again, these are tournaments that you just otherwise couldn't sign up and play for. So they're creating positive you know, ranking and skill development opportunities because of that. Uh, Linville Cup, again, a very unique opportunity to have the mentorship part as well as the team atmosphere that that, that provides. Um, and then additionally with our regional players, we, many of our regional events, especially in the spring and early summer, our regional or local qualifiers into the M national championship um, regional finals. So you're getting access to a spot in those regional finals to try to uh, compete for a spot to go to the national championship. Uh, so again, the local tournaments have these additional opportunities that are presenting themselves if you start to excel at the developmental level. Pushing to the, the national championship, this is another a new thing that we added last year to the PKB program through our partnership with the Nota Begay Group. And this has this three-step process, like I mentioned. So you can locally qualify, whether it's through some PKB regional events, or if you have enough status, we have multiple exemption statuses for PKB members that can go straight to a regional final. Uh, the regional finals, for example, our North Carolina regional final is this weekend. Uh, we've got upcoming regional finals in Kentucky and Ohio uh, in June, and then Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania, New Jersey coming up in July and early August. Um, so you've got a lot of great opportunities to, to try to qualify. <clears throat> There's four different divisions within this championship. Uh, they're actually based off of age, so every two years starting at 10. Um, so these are, it's a real unique opportunity. It was at the national championship last year. You hopefully you caught it on the golf channel when it aired in, in December, but it's a really neat tournament, really well done. Great uh, national event, you know, to be a part of an event that has that level of, of grandeur and you've got the TV cameras out there filming. It's just a, it's a good um, 
building opportunity for a player uh, to kind of see what the next level of golf looks like and, you know, kind of have that feel like a pro um, environment. So. So as you look moving forward, it's here's some ideas that I would have um, as far as tips for developing a tournament schedule. So when you're trying to decide which tournament should I choose or what's the right level of competition for my daughter, here's a couple of tips to, to kind of put together um, to help you in that evaluation process. Um, so the first I would say is know the purpose of the tournament you are registering for. Why are you playing? Is it strictly that I'm just playing for experience? And uh, is it just, man, this is a great golf course. I, I want to, you know, selfishly, I want to go walk around this course and my daughter's going to enjoy playing it. You know, um, is it, are we trying to play to try to win? Is this an opportunity for, you know, your player to, to as I call it, you know, sleep on a lead? You know, that's a different mentality than just showing up to play. Entering a tournament that you think you may win creates new pressure, anxiety, um, the ability to deal with expectation and management of that is a big piece of becoming a competitive golfer. You know, it's you spend a lot of money developing their swings and games with lessons, but half of the probably the game is how do you actually apply that skill that you've learned? And uh, applying that is much more emotional and psychological than it is physical. So there, there are pieces. That has, that's a learned skill for most people. It's not something that's just inherently there. So being in those environments, that's what I love about the progression, is that sleeping on a lead feels the same in futures as it does in Bell. Um, whether you're playing for things, you know, you're learning that that emotional stability and that uh, resolve that's needed to be, you know, competitively and, and strong to, to have that competitive spirit. Um, so so that's that can be a key choice in, in why you may choose tournaments and, you know, where you are in a process. Um, you know, like we just spent multiple uh, minutes talking about trying to qualify for future events. Is this event opening up doors for, for future opportunity? And, and along those lines, you know, we're trying to develop a ranking. So, you know, we're trying to create opportunity. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, I put the note at the bottom, you know, playing with the expectation to win or compete is not the same as just playing a competitive round. They are two separate, separate pieces um, because they bring in expectation, both the parent's expectation on the child, which they do feel, they do watch you. They are watching how you react to how they play. Um, but for the player themselves, they're motivated individually to, to want to achieve and to try to, um, you know, make you proud for, for all the effort that you've put in to get to put them there and to, to take them there. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a big part of the developmental process. Um, next piece is focusing on competing at an appropriate yardage. Um, you know, I get lots of families and things, you know, sometimes you want to jump ahead um, because maybe a friend started playing, um, you know, at a higher level or or maybe in your, your home state, you play with certain girls when you play the local events. So you feel like that that's your level, even though your scores don't match them. So I think a big piece you want to look at if you're focusing on the development of your player is what is the appropriate yardage for them with where their game is. So focus on scoring and game development. Look at where the pressure is placed on T accuracy and wedge play um, and putting, you know, understanding where the deficiency is. Um, I hear pretty much by almost every parent that their kid is long. You know, every parent tells me that yardage is not a problem for their daughter. And statistically, that can't be true. Um, so you've got to look at, even if she can hit a driver sometimes really long, is it straight? Is it in play? And should she be even hitting driver on these holes if it's not setting herself up to score? You know, if, if, if your child is really, really long and we still can't break 90, then there's still issues that need to be evaluated within the development of the player that 
putting them into a tournament environment that just makes those things accentuated because they're not being forced to learn the skills that they're deficient in, then you're not helping their developmental process. So you're just slowing down. You're just replicating the same pieces. Um, so so be, be very aware of, of that because it's golf doesn't get easier as it gets longer. It doesn't matter how long the player is. The par fours get longer. That's one of the biggest stresses in junior girls golf is as the yardage gets added, the par fours get longer. And that means, you know, your accuracy with your irons, your ability with your short game become accentuated even more because you're going to hit less greens. And depending on the conditions, you know, getting up and down is very challenging. Having the, the putting is going to be even more a focal point. Uh, so, you know, are you setting your player up for success if you're putting them into these situations that they're not prepared for because their complete game is not developed? Um, so, um, you know, I, I always talk about, you know, create a solid foundation by gaining above average proficiency at the building blocks of successful golfers. Again, accuracy, wedge play, putting. Those are the pieces that that you've got to have to score. Um, and when you're thinking about moving up another place, you know, I put this in here. It is truly about development. So you're truly focused on your player's development if, you know, your scores justify a stiffer test and competition from the course, either by the difficulty of the course of the yardage. So I continually am scoring really low from the current place I'm playing, so I'm ready to move up. Or my finishes justify a stiffer test and competition. So I'm winning a lot. I'm finishing in the top three in all my tournaments. Okay, I need to find players that are better than me, you know, because you're just winning, you know, winning 100 U.S. kids tournaments is not pushing you to the next level. You know, you've, you've proven that stat before. So you've got to continue to, to develop in this process. Or my age justifies an acceleration of the progression because I'm running out of time. Sometimes, especially for our, you know, rising juniors, rising seniors, they, you know, the, the scoring may not meet all the standards, but, you know, we've got to get back to our prep level yardage or our bell level yardage because we're, we're, we're looking at collegiate golf and, and we're trying to make that progression. But if you if you're not able to answer yes to one of those three and you're feeling like your child needs to be pushed more or whatever, you are probably it's not about the development. It may be something else, whether it's, you know, again, trying to keep up with their friends or keeping up with the Joneses. Um, you know, it becomes about ego versus about what's in the best interest of this child's development and learning those skills that they need to ultimately become a golfer. Um, you know, I think these are the lessons that for me, having done this now 17 years and watched so many girls come through the process of all different skill levels and watching that development, I think this that piece is one of the best pieces of advice I can give is you really want to trust the process. And I actually have a couple of trust the process slides because um, I, I think it just crystallizes the point of it, it works if you if you stay within the pathway. So Amanda Sambach, this is a case study. You know, she's a sophomore, just finishing her sophomore season at University of Virginia. She just won the ACC Individual Championships. She set the school record for scoring. Um, she's 27th in the world in amateur golf. That's every amateur player in the world. She's almost in the top 25. And this is a player, when she was a junior, she played Futures her first year. She was the best player. She won Order of Merit. She moved up a level. She won Order of Merit at the prep level. Then she moved up the next level, moved to the Bell level, which she ultimately won that. So this is an elite level player that still stayed within the process. Because again, there was development that needed to be done at each of these pieces. So it was increasing. So there wasn't this trying to jump ahead and trying to get out front of something. It was making sure that the player was, you know, the confidence of the player as well as the skills of the player were being developed along the way. Um, and then, you know, obviously she went off to a, a great junior career, was one of the top juniors in the country, you know, playing on national teams, AJGA, highest level, you know, and then now having extreme success 
at the collegiate game heading towards a potential professional career. Um, so, you know, as I joke with some families, it was good enough for her. Um, so it may be good enough for your daughter. Um, so, you know, just keeping in mind that, that these, these pathway, this pathway exists and has, uh, you know, for a reason and that there is a method to, to the process. Um, the next piece is understanding, and I hit on this a little bit before, about understanding the impacts of moving to a longer setup or to a more elite event. So this is kind of gets to the psychology as well as the, the physical tools necessary for the player. Uh, the first piece is advancement increases the difficulty of the golf course and the course rating. So that's a good thing from, um, you know, we're trying to improve our rain. Of course, rating goes into how you figure out scoring differential, which is the major part of your junior's ranking. Um, but if you're if you move up and you can't maintain the scores that you're shooting, then the higher course rating is not helping. Your, your actual scoring difference is going to go down. Um, so that's, that's a key thing to keep in mind. Um, you know, it puts increased pressure on the longer approach shots. Like I mentioned, the par fours become very long. Uh, the par threes even are going to get a little longer. So you're, the hybrids become a much bigger role in having the accuracy there to hit greens and regulation. Um, there's increased pressure on up and downs. Statistically, look at all the tours, look at every piece. Every time the club gets longer, the accuracy goes down. So, you know, where you may have been hitting wedges and nine irons before, now we're hitting seven irons and six irons. You know, you're probably losing 10 to 15 percent accuracy, you know, as you're moving back. As well as I think that this is something not to discount is the increased expectation of the child and the parent. Um, you know, the parents like I'm investing more. Typically, the higher level events probably cost a little bit more. They, you may have to travel a little further for them. Uh, that means you're taking off work. That means you may have to go an extra day early to play a practice round and different pieces that come with that. The child's also feeling that. They understand the effort and financial and time that's going into this opportunity for them. So they're putting that on themselves as well to justify the validity of that choice by how they play, which just adds more pressure to an already difficult game. And obviously the player is feeling it's going to be a little uneasy. This is a new environment for them. These are higher players, players they probably look up to, players that they want to be like, and now they're going to be in that environment. Um, how are they going to perform in that? Um, you know, and, and being prepared for, for that piece. So making sure that, you know, this is ultimately a positive experience and is, is a developmentally positive experience uh, versus a deflating one. Um, because, you know, the player wants to perform at this higher level. They're trying to prove they're worthy to keep up, you know, and that, that psychological pressure there um, that, that comes. Uh, it's one of the big pieces of advice I give when looking about moving up to next level events is moving up to the middle. And the, the premise there is if you're going to go to an, a new event that you feel is at a higher level, the expectation should be that your player can finish in the middle of that field or better. Or maybe it's not the right fit because you don't want to just go up to an event to try to finish last. E, two things. One, the player is getting this validation that they're not good enough, which is probably not going to help them to want to stay, um, you know, developing their game and practicing and all the things that go. Um as well as you're showing whoever is following your daughter that she's not good and not ready for that as well. So you're validating <laughs> uh, those pieces. You know, uh, you can't jump your ranking too much. You know, that your ranking, whether you feel that it is an accurate reflection of your daughter's current skills or not, is a statistical objective view of it. So making sure that you're moving at steps that are attainable and and you know beneficial can will actually get you to the promised land faster than trying to jump two steps go play in a field that they may not be ready for and then ultimately not do well because you're not getting any of the value of that experience you know if you don't beat anybody in the field your strength of field number doesn't go up you, you didn't beat anybody higher than you so it doesn't you don't get the benefit of that 
And if the higher course rating from that tournament, if your scores were so high that you did, you also didn't improve your differential. So, you know, besides you get to tell somebody you played in that event, that's all you got. Um, so you've got to, you know, be weighing those choices um, when, when looking at when you're making these next pieces. Um, saying that, I, I don't want to try to, you know, be the negative that it's always, you know, don't push yourself. You know, I've played competitive athletics my whole life. You know, you, you want to be looking for these opportunities to test yourself at the next level. The key is making sure that you're, the player is ready and that the player, um, you know, fits into that environment because you're always going to want to be testing your, your skills and balancing that with maybe events that are, you know, she, she can ultimately be successful in. So maybe finding that balance of those two when you start to introduce higher level tournaments. Um, again, a, a trust the process slide of this is the Futures National um, Order of Merit from over 10 years ago now. And here's the interesting thing about this slide, the number, three, five, and six players on this list, and not the one and two, um, but the three, five, the three and six are currently on the LPGA Tour. Um, the fifth one just won a national championship and actually just qualified for Pebble Beach today. Um, so they're, you know, three of the best players in the world. They didn't win Futures National back when they played. And you can see they played a lot of tournaments. You know, these were... Development is going to happen at different levels. These were great players at this age, but they they did you know just because you weren't elite when you were twelve doesn't mean you're not going to be elite when you're eighteen. Um, there's the, the commitment, especially for these three players, that was just off the charts that they had for developing their games. Um, but you know it's a process that that you're you're, you're going to work through. Um. Developing a schedule, you know, you, there is a piece, as we talked about, developing a player profile, um, which is typically defined um, or partially defined by your ranking, uh, being that that is a, um, you know, statistical number that can try to create meaning to a, a player's resume. Um, most rankings are the last 12 months of your results. So that's what's being evaluated. Um, so, you know, how will this affect my rating? Is this an important thing to care about? If you're not ranked inside the top 1500 in the country, the answer is probably no, um, because you still are just, you know, you're still in that developmental process of you just need to start playing, shooting lower scores and tournament level competitions. So as long as you're playing multi-day tournaments and you're playing good events, you know, that you can get into, whether that's the PKB um, or, or your higher ranked other events, you know, those are those are giving you the exposure that you need at that point. You know, you're not, you know, a, a college coach is not carrying the difference between a seven rank player ranked 1800 in the country and ranked 1600 in the country. There is just there's no difference realistically between those. So if you're not in that phase, then rankings probably are not the driving factor that you should be looking at in choosing tournaments. Um, and again, coming to, you know, the rankings, you know, good scores are the majority. Most ranking systems, it's about two thirds of your ranking is how you played. So what your score was minus the scoring, um, the, the course rating for that tournament round, which is known as scoring differential. Um, that's that's going to be the driving factor that's going to help improve. Um, one day events provide a unique opportunity for you to work on your game, especially if you're trying to start adding yardage. Being that those events are not ranked through Junior Golf Scoreboard, you're able to develop. You're working on a swing change. You just got new clubs. Um, you're a futures player preparing to move back yardage and you're going to start playing prep regional events. These one day events are great, great opportunities to go try to compete. Um, you've got a player that may has lost a little bit of confidence. Go to a prep event and try to win it. You know, go to a regional event and show up knowing that I, if I play well, I could win. You know, that's, these are great confidence building events that can, it can build um, you know, this player up and, and start to feel some success that then hopefully they can apply when they put it out there at the national multi-day level. 
Um, and the biggest thing, if you know, you're looking at tournament selection and, and ranking. So if you do have a higher ranked player and you're considering different tournaments to play in, you know, the, the higher the course rating, it is going to help um, because, you know, it, the, you have to shoot a lower, a higher, a higher score is going to be worth more against a higher course rating. Right. Um, but I, I put this example in here because this was a, a player, this is actually from multiple years ago, but this was a player that went and played a, one of the for-profit tours, elite level events. Uh, the player, as you can see, won the event. So the top one was before the tournament, the second phase is after the tournament. So they won the event but their strength of tournament went down and their scoring differential once went up because again, the course rating wasn't enough because the tournament was played at 5,500 yards for a elite tournament. So ultimately that player's ranking went down by 50, 60 spots in an event they won. So this is an example of a player playing an event that didn't meet their skill level. So their ranking was too high for the field they chose. So was this a good choice for the player? Well, if, if the course was a dream course that they never played before, or maybe a college coach was at that tournament that said, hey, I can come watch you, will you play? If maybe one of those two scenarios happened, then we could say, yes, that was a good choice. Otherwise, this you know that selection of tournament actually may have set that player back a little bit. You know, for the next 12 months, that tournament's going to be on that player's resume. And even though they won it, again, it didn't help their development. So those are the, the, the kind of things that can kind of come in the, in the process when you're evaluating these. Um, and last, you know, I kind of hit on this a little bit about what tournaments are worth. Um, I've got a note here um, about, you know, course rating. Again, those are set by the USGA. There's no wiggle room. The tours don't get to set that. That's set by the, the USGA standard based on the yardage that you play out. The only choice the tour has is what yardage they can test the event at. Um, so from a Peggy Kirk Bell standpoint, you know, our Bell tournaments are going to be 6,000 plus. Our prep tournaments are going to be 5,700 plus, And our Futures national events are going to be 5,400 plus typically. Those are kind of the ranges that we're looking at. Um, and then strength of field, this is one of those pieces that is has some subjectivity, but uh, this chart is looking actually analysis of the golf week rankings. And you can see how the different levels of tournaments in the country are, are ranked as far as the quality of the fields that they're looking at. So this is looking at the Pell, you know, the main um, Bell National. This is just Bell National if you're looking at PKB. Uh, but you can see the other tours and the uh, different tiers. Um, I put this on here a lot because, you know, a lot of players always ask about AJGA and is this right for my daughter and do I have to play? Um, you know, you can see there's multiple levels within their program. Their invitationals are the best tournaments in the country, typically, um, and their opens are strong, but their all-star and preview events, uh, you know, for example, the AJGA preview events, strength of field wise, look a lot like PKB's prep preview events. Um, so not every event within a tour or series is as strong as each. Same with the Peggy Kirk Bell Tour. Our national sign up and play events aren't typically as strong as our priority based entry events or, you know, which aren't as strong as our invitationals. So you have different tiers within most organizations. Um, so, so understanding that uh, is also can help you assign value uh, to the events. The best thing you can do typically is look at the previous year's field. How big was it? Do you recognize any names? What were the scores being shot? that won the tournament? What did the player who finished 10th shoot? You know, that's going to tell you how deep the fields are. That That's going to help you evaluate whether this is a field, you know, this is a tournament that has value for, for a player looking for ranking development. And last, you know, you're looking at uh, most tournaments have what they call a multiplier sound established. The multiplier is typically how your how the organization itself is judging that tournament. So if it has a higher multiplier, that tournament series believes it's a better event. Um, for those players in the Carolinas, the CGA ranks uh, tournaments within this area. So they put different weighting on different events. Um, the AJGA through their performance-based entry program 
will give different priority based entry stars on different levels of events. So you can have 12 star events, you can have fully exempt events, you can have their uh, four star events, which are your basics. Uh, so there's different, you know, that's that tiering system that you're seeing if you're looking and trying to evaluate the quality of a tournament. Um, and last, uh, I think when you're looking at tournaments and you're trying to develop a schedule, you know, it's will it help me get seen by a coach? If you're looking and developing to try to play collegiate golf, then um, getting in front of college coaches is really important. Um, at the end of the day, scores matter most. You know, the college, they're, they're going to start their, their evaluation of your player by looking at their resume and how do they play in tournaments. And then they're going to then create a crop of players that they have interest in. And that's where they're going to hit the recruiting trail to go watch these players. You know, that that's um, it was a really interesting tidbit this weekend. A high level power five division one coach was at uh, the open championship this weekend. And for those who, who were in the region, it was miserably rainy all three days. Um, and this coach came out on the first day and I, I mentioned I was surprised that they were there out in the rain. And, and the reply was, well, this is the type of day where I'm going to learn more about the player than I'll ever learn on a good day. They were there to watch, you know, how they were reacting to the scenarios, how they were dealing with the adverse conditions. How do they deal when a shot didn't go well because they hit it fat in the water, whatever it was. Um, you know, and that I think that's the thing you want to keep in mind when coaches are out watching. They are not watching how you score during the three, seven, nine holes they watch. They're watching for the the piece. They're looking at your ball flight when you hit your driver. They're looking at the choices you made if you got into trouble or if you did make a mistake, how did you respond? Those are the pieces that are they're evaluating. They're not evaluating your score. That's what your that's what your playing resume evaluates. That shows what happens when they're not there. And that's much more of you know a bigger data set than the three or five holes they're watching. They're also watching the parent. How is the parent reacting to the way the player is playing? Is this a parent that they want to deal with for four years? Because they're getting you as well as the kid. So keep that in mind of, of that recruiting process. Um, you know, coaches sometimes will request players to play certain events. Hey, I'm going to watch this uh, player in this event. Can you come? I'd love to see you play. Okay, that event just became more valuable because um, you're going to get a chance to potentially play in front of a coach that you may want to go to their school. Um, you know, to this other place, you know, your attitude, your swing, the intangibles, these are the things that are going to differentiate you from the other players that may look like you on paper. Um, because you, your scores, again, are, are a piece of it, but these other factors, uh, the same with, um, you know, your academics, that academics are a disqualifier, um, not usually the deciding factor. So you want to make sure that they're good enough that they create, they open doors for you and don't close them. Um, and, and the last piece I talk about, and this kind of goes back to making sure you're in the right environment, is, you know, if you get into a tournament, if you try to get to play tournaments that you're not ready for, all you're doing is proving to that coach that you're not ready and that you're not good enough to play for them. So you don't want, just because, you know, you got in or you, you get this exemption, you know, you want to make sure you're ready for it. You want to prepare because it's, again, it's sitting on your resume for 12 months. So you want to make sure... Uh, that you're not. And please, I can just speaking from conversations and otherwise, withdrawing in the middle of events to hide from bad rounds is about the worst thing you could do. When they see withdrawals, they just don't believe that every player in the country has a wrist injury. Like you, you, the, these withdrawals are showing it's becoming a little more of an epidemic right now. You and the coaches know it. And they're looking at those and saying, you know, is this player going to, to be able to gut it out when they have to, when they're playing the conference championship or it starts raining that they can, they can actually play in the rain because they've, you know, they didn't skip every event where it rained when they were a junior. You know, you, you, you've got to realize that the, a bad score happens. You know, you want to be able to show on a resume what you did after it and be able to show that you can bounce back. And those are skills. These are the intangible pieces that they're ultimately looking for. Last, I did, didn't want to go through this presentation without mentioning that, you know, especially as you start to move up the ladder 
it gets more expensive. And, and there is, we do have financial need, need, uh, aid programs uh, for, for players that need assistance. Um, so, you know, our Inspire Dream Achieve grant, for example, uh, does 50% off entry fees for, for families in need. Uh, we have yearly grants that can go to help you assist with the cost of tournaments. And uh, so if, if you do yourself uh, have a, a financial need or you know of families that may need financial need that may play on your high school teams, please please have them reach out and inquire about these opportunities. Again, that's why this why our nonprofit exists is to create these opportunities. Uh, so I just want to make sure I mention that. Um, so in, in in summary here, you know your your ideal schedule is going to strike a balance between you know maximizing the resources. Again, your it's entry fees, it's travel, it's time from work and school. You know that that's a big it's a big commitment. So make sure you're balancing that with. Okay, where is my developmental opportunity? You know, what am I getting out of this moment um, in this tournament? Is it is it you know worth that? And always focusing on the advancements of skills. You know, getting the player to have the confidence and the application of the skills they're learning on the lesson T and putting that into action to create lower scores is ultimately what we're after because that's what's going to open the doors for the next chapter, whether that's the next level of event or that's an opportunity to play collegiate golf or whatever it is, getting the scores to be lower is how we get there. Um, so what are we doing um, to, to do that? So, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, you want to have some success. You've got to make sure your player has moments of success because why else would you play? Like, well, you know, it's not any fun just to, you know, not do well all the time. So, you know, make sure that you're balancing that in your tournament selection, that your your players getting those motivation moments. Everybody loves to have their picture taken and hold a trophy. So having those moments in it is really a piece of the puzzle. So with that, um, I'd love if you have any questions uh, that, that anybody has that they'd like to ask uh, through this different piece, I'll be happy to answer that uh, here for a couple minutes. And otherwise, I uh, will um, push this. Of course, we'll have our webinars up online and you can um, you know, rewatch this if you have any questions or wanna see a slide, um, as well as uh, you know, come a couple of our past webinars. We did one on uh, rankings recently. Uh, parents' role in the recruiting process is always a good one. Um, and then we do have a webinar upcoming in a couple of weeks. Uh, Brandy Jackson, our recruit PKB college consultant, is going to be doing a segment on preparing rising juniors for June 15th. That's the date when the recruiting starts where coaches can now communicate directly with players. Uh, so there's going to be a webinar about that day and what to expect if you have a player that's entering that window. So. Uh, if I have any questions, I'll stay on for another minute or so. Uh, but otherwise, have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. And if you have a question, use the chat function or I will uh, close this down. All right. Appreciate the thank yous. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys at uh, a, new, a PKB event this summer. Take care.